Alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. I uh, hope you all are doing well. Um, so we're going to continue on. This is the second class in this uh, in this mini series that we have on building healthy relationships, marriages, and homes. And um, what we were discussing last time were some of the building blocks that uh, we can use as uh, part of the framework that we're going to develop to build uh, healthy homes, relationships, and marriages. And the building blocks, the way that they work, as we as we discussed, it's just kind of a recap is that they can apply to us in any context, in any situation. So some of those folks that might be watching or that might uh, be attending the class, you might already be in a stage where you are married. Somebody might, uh, Someone might have children. Somebody else might be looking to get married. Somebody else might be more advanced in age and just uh, you know, someone who's, who has a home that they're trying to improve the environment of. So all of the building blocks that exist in our tradition to help us fortify our home environment are going to be applicable at every stage and the key is that we just learn to 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 to, to know where are we going to put these um, and how are we going to apply these and so uh, as we did last time we will inshallah try to give examples um, for for us to, to understand how to apply them inshallah so we'll go ahead and begin so last time we discussed uh, two core building blocks the first one is love and compassion the second one is respect and dignity. Today, inshallah, we will try to cover uh, about three more. Um, and then the next class, we will hopefully be will be done with the building blocks and we'll move on to um, uh, the next the next section, inshallah. Uh, so, and if you're, if you're uh, here and you have questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask or wait till the end um, for those who are watching online or on a live stream. Um, and please just uh, wait for the end for the questions and then we'll go ahead and... Um, uh, do those at the uh, the last part, inshallah. Bismillah. Okay, so let's go ahead. So the the next primary building block that we want to cover, um, this is all about building uh, healthy communication. Um, so effective communication. So this is going to be really important, depending on um, how familiar someone is with the person that they are trying to communicate with. Uh, so let's define what effective communication is first. We'll then discuss how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references it in the Quran, some examples from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then getting into some practical examples for how we apply it. So the goal here is to, to cultivate a culture and environment in our homes, in our lives, with our families, of clear, clear number one, respectful number two, and empathetic communication that focuses on strengthening relationships and then resolving misunderstandings effectively. So something to understand here that we are going to, if as when human beings interact, they the primary way that we interact is we've been blessed with, with words to be able to communicate. We can communicate with each other. Now, when people communicate and they live in an environment together, there's also going to be times where there's conflict. And so in order to communicate, in order to learn to resolve that conflict effectively, one has to know how to communicate in that context with that person in that situation effectively. And that's what we're gonna, they're going to talk about here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Quran a very, very well-known verse, Ya amanu, wa qulu qawlan sadida, That, O oh, you who believe, be aware of Allah, be mindful of Allah, and speak clear words or speak in a straightforward manner. Um, and then Allah mentions the benefit of, uh, of doing this. So that's the first, um, one of the, the, the main references in the Quran as it comes to speech. So how do we understand this as it relates to effective communication in our home? The first thing Allah is saying, he's not just saying speak in a straightforward manner, meaning be, be frank with everybody. That's not what this ayah is saying. It's saying be aware of Allah. So know that Allah is watching you and Allah is watching what you're about to say and how you're about to say it, and who you're about to saying it to, and the voice that you're going to have, and the tone that you're going to have. And all of the ways that we um, are going to discuss when it comes to building relationships and home environments, all of them boil down to if somebody can understand that Allah is truly always present and always watching them, they will be, we will be very careful at how we treat Allah's creation, especially those people who Allah has either made us um, uh, in charge of or people who are in our home, or people who we're supposed to have very strong bonds and relationships with. So Allah says, Ittaqullah, that, that have mindfulness of Allah, and then speak in a straightforward manner. Now this is important. 
in our tradition, it's very important for effective communication to make sure that the, the communication happens in the first place and that it actually addresses the topic that we're trying to address. So too many in too many situations, too many people, when it comes to relationships that they um, that they have, whether that's a marriage, whether that's uh, husband and uh, whether that's um, uh, mothers and fathers, whether that's with their children, we can't get across what we really want to say, and so we just either beat around the bush or people don't say what they need to say. Then they bottle up these feelings deep down inside, and then it can be the cause, according to multiple studies, of all sorts of psychological, physical, emotional um, problems that they are going to endure and that they're going to face because they never communicated what it is that was on their mind. We're, we're, we are people who are supposed to communicate. It's, it's, it's important. And it's okay to communicate to our spouses. It's okay to communicate even difficult matters to our spouses or to our parents or to um, uh, you know siblings or, or whoever else it is. What's far worse is somebody is too shy to communicate or too nervous to communicate, and then they don't end up getting out what they want to say, but then it turns into a much uh, bigger conflict later on. And Allah knows that this potential exists inside of the human being, that if we don't get out what we need to get out in terms of a conversation, again, respectfully with adab, with etiquette, what happens later is that um, that person can uh, really erupt and all this anger, or these emotions that had been boiled in for or been boiling up for years or for months or for however long of a period of time, they can come out in a difficult situation. We don't want that to happen. We want to be effective communicators. So this is one of the ayahs that are relevant to this and we'll, we'll expand on a few more. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions um, that وَقُولُ nasi husna And speak to people good words. So we are taught to be aware of Allah. We're taught to communicate in a straightforward manner, meaning we, we should have some level of um, saying what it is that, that we have to say in a situation. And we are taught to speak to people good words. And this is what? What are good words? This, is, this sets the standard for gentle, respectful communication with the right tone and in a situation where the words will carry, um, uh, will actually be effective with the person that we're trying to, to communicate to. Right. So we do not want to have ineffective communication where um, if you want, for example, somebody, let's say someone wants their kids to do something, and the way that they get their kids to do something is they yell at them. Yo, why don't you go and you know clean your room? And your room's always so messy and so on. In that situation, there's a chance that the, that the child cleans the room. There's also a chance that the child doesn't clean the room. Um, and then the child now is uh, further upset or in a situation where they're not going to listen to things easily or they'll behave in a disrespectful way. And then because we set the precedent for behaving disrespectfully first, yelling and 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 um, belittling and putting people down, even our, you know that somebody's family members, it's very significant. And if we are now the ones who are teaching them what we discussed last time, disrespectful communication, and then when they're disrespectful to us, then they're in a state of sin, and we're the cause of that sin. And so it's 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 a, it's a serious problem that we want to try to avoid. So effective communication is going to be really important. This is even more important for people who are in the process of trying to figure out a relationship, either trying to get married or trying or are or newly married, right? So in that context, what ends up happening is um, you have to, 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 in the process of trying to build a potential relationship with a potential partner, the important topics have to be discussed. They have to be discussed. And we'll get into a section later on, inshallah, in the class, uh, in, a, in a future session, on some of the practical elements that we can take as someone is going through the process of trying to find a spouse, right? So now, again, this is for somebody who's, you know, who would not, who's not already married but is looking to, to get married. Um, but if somebody is in that process and they don't discuss the things that are important to them, they don't communicate what's important to them, and they don't learn the skills of effective communication, you could go months, sometimes much longer talking to somebody and not have have discussed any of the critical things that are important to assess, is this a viable partner, right? And that's why our religion, actually the Prophet Islam, he gave us a framework for how we go about evaluating whether somebody is, is viable, viable for us, viable for, will, will we be viable with their family? Will they be viable with our family? Our religion is a religion where family is important, uh, and it's important to make sure that families are, you know, there's a level of integration or compatibility or at least respect that's possible. And those things have to be addressed. 
and it's 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 uh, sometimes you know I have come across situations where you know someone will be talking to someone for the purpose of marriage for six months my, or longer than that, and they still don't ha can't even figure out what this person's like basic religious values are. Like, do they pray five times a day? They they weren't able to assess that yet because the conversations are like very Western influenced conversations that just say all sorts of random topics about sports and music. And there's nothing wrong with those topics, but like get to the fundamentals at some point. Cause you don't want someone ideally who is completely on the opposite ends with you and just say, Oh no, no, no. But I have feelings for this person. Feelings will go away very fast when marriage comes. And what's left is, was there a true spiritual compatibility? Because feelings can be lustful feelings that come from shaitan. They do not have to be what's called mawadda and rahma, as we discussed in the earlier class, um, which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, which, which Allah puts in the heart of people, um, uh, especially when they, they are uh, married. And so uh, so we were just saying communicate in a straightforward manner and then speak to people kindly in a good, in good, with good words. This is really important when, when there's any authority, authority a relationship with um, with somebody, right? So again, we talk, discuss parent and child. There's an authority there. So if we model uh, speaking to people with bad words or bad language, that's not going to go over well. In the relationship between husband and wife, if uh, and wife and husband, if the children see that they're not speaking good words to each other, that they're not saying loving words to each other, that they're not showing affection regularly, that they're not saying words like um, uh, uh, you know, co complimenting each other and saying, uh, showing affection, saying "I love you," these types of things, and they just see bickering and banter, and then we go on to see the siblings bickering and yelling and not having a really good relationship. Like the our kids, we have nobody to blame but ourselves, and and so don't say "Why don't you guys ever get along?" because they just saw mom and dad didn't really get along, and it's really really unfortunate because the prophetic household was a household where yes, there were times where there was conflict and it was tense, but the words that were spoken to each other were words of affection, beauty, love, and when things were said that were difficult, they were done with gentleness. Thinking about, hold on a second, this person has done so much for me, I should be very careful to, 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 to uh, how I communicate to them and making sure that I keep in mind their, their heart. Versus um, sometimes in our society, people are very, very polite, and have all this etiquette with people at work and you know you go to the store and a very how are you and so on and so forth and then when it comes to the family no etiquette no adab just all uh, over directness and being rude and again doing the opposite of this ayah allah says we should be especially focused on maintaining family ties and then the ayahs that result that, that dis discuss communication should be even more emphasized when it comes to our families and there's various hadith which complement this and which support this. One hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions, for example, a kind word is charity, it's a sadaqah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there's another hadith which mentions smiling is a charity. We should be people who, the environment, in order to have positive communication at home, the environment has to be positive in the first place. So positive environments are cultivated through multiple things, but one of them is that the, the words that we hear are positive, and, and number two, we, and we, we don't hear derogatory words. There's absence of put-downs and derogatory words and curse words. And then number three, there's a mood and an atmosphere that's created through people's mannerisms and interactions that are also positive. This now creates the, um, it, it, it fertilizes the soil to then be able to have effective positive communication. And we've all had a situation where Maybe somebody was like in a good mood and they were trying to have a good conversation with us and we're just like upset and frowning and angry. And it's just, it's just, you just, you just, dude, you just killed the mood completely. Like what's up? Well, what's going on? And now imagine at home if, uh, you know, there's four people in the house and one person is just always in a sour mood and just, just always bringing down thing, the, the, the vibe. Nobody is going to feel comfortable then. And the home is supposed to be the place of comfort and of sakina. And then what's going to happen is people are going to seek that comfort and sakina outside of the home. That's what ends up happening usually, um, that, that people t t end up seeking these, uh, these things in different, in different environments. And so um, the Prophet, والسلام, there's a couple of practices that he had when it came to communication. One is that he would very much be present with the person who was communicating with him. Um, and I believe we mentioned this last time. So effective communication requires presence. We cannot, in a, if we're trying to build a relationship with a prospective spouse, if we're newly married, if we are, if we are 
um, been married for 20, 30, 40 years, if we're talking with our kids, none of those situations call for us, uh, let's say, like, watch, like just kind of absorbed in Netflix while we're trying to have a conversation with them or absorbed on our phone while we're trying to have a conversation with them. It just doesn't work because they're saying, hey, you, you really think that that, you know, article you're reading about whatever politics, uh, whatever political situation right now um, is more uh, worthy of your attention than me. And there's nothing wrong with, with, with doing other things, but they should just be done at the right time, right? One of our teachers always said, like, everything should be put in its proper place. So meaning we just, okay, there's a time for conversation. Then there's a time when we have work to do. Then there's a time where we have to, you know, we might need to read or we might need to catch up on something. We might need to read the news. There's a time where you somebody might watch, you know, whatever they have their own leisure time, whatever it is in your life, in your individual context. But when you try to merge all of them and the phone is, uh, is always present, and the distractions are always present, now the person on the other end, they're like, oh, you really don't actually want to hear what it is that I'm saying. And then when we, when we don't listen to them a few times, the, bear, the trust in the communication breaks down. And then it's going to be very difficult for there to be deep, um, uh, true deep communication later on in life, right? All this stuff, it starts at the early ages, and it starts where we, we, we um, uh, try to uh, model the positive communication. So those are a few of the things that we should do. Then there's, um, then there's also a few things that we should make sure we do not do. So um, uh, there are forms of communicating which can be considered like aggressive forms of communication and that those should be avoided, right? Violent or aggressive forms of communication. These could be constantly blaming somebody um, in the way that we speak. These could be uh, re regularly raising our voice at, at, at things that really we should really never need to raise our voice that frequently. But um, we start, if we start to do that right where the voice is raised, uh, these could be um, passing uh, rude comments and remarks when someone else is speaking or having a conversation. Um, these could be uh, make, making somebody feel judged and unwelcome. Right? There's going to be times where someone in our family is going to say something that's going to go against maybe... Uh, the way we'd like we operate in our life or the moral code maybe that we have or something something to that effect and if that takes place you do not you and I do not want to be in a situation where we are uh, behaving arrogantly with somebody or making them feel less than or making them feel judged because now what's going to happen is the trust is going to break that trust is slowly 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 going to break and they're not going to want to tell us whatever it is that they are telling us so part of communication is being present with the person and understanding what they have to say. And if they're coming to us as an elder or for advice or for guidance or whatever it is, we have to be there to actually listen and not like kind of roll our eyes and pass off, you know, pass rude comments and so on and so forth, even if what they're saying is not appealing to us, right? Um, so, so communication is done ideally without blame and it's 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 done without judgment this is really really important and this is shown through various studies that it improves uh, family relationships and it reduces conflicts it improves family relationships and reduces conflicts um, so that's 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 one um, part of this uh, the uh, the other part is that we then model healthy ways of discussing difficult topics this is really hard and we'll have a section when we talk about this inshallah but it's not easy to have difficult conversations. But there's various approaches people take. The first approach is avoidance. I'm never going to have the difficult topic. And when the difficult discussion comes up, I'm just going to run away from it. And I see this actually happening more and more now where um, people who I, who I know, they're, let's say they're in their 20s and it comes time where maybe uh, the marriage discussion you know, starts to come up more in the home. Parents start to pressure them. Uh, or they start to feel the pressure or whatever else. Or they have a desire to get married or whatever else it is. And... Instead of having like a healthy, mature discussion, like, okay, it's time to get married. Let's discuss what your criteria are. Let's discuss if I'm a parent, how I can help, how I can facilitate this, um, or where are you at? Is there anyone you're already considering? And then having a healthy discussion, it, 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 it starts with sometimes people just being like, well, what, what's going on? When are you going to do this? Like time, the clock is ticking. Don't you know this person's already married? Or like in the most awkward times like on a car ride home from some wedding of some friend well they got married why aren't you married yet and it's it's such a um uh such a poor way to handle such a sensitive subject and so communication also has to be especially done with wisdom 
for people who are, in, again, in positions of influence or authority, right? Um, it has to be done with delicacy, right? And we have to understand the person who we are communicating to. And we can't do so in a way that, again, uh, co uh, communication that does a lot, has a lot of comparison in it and that has a lot of um, comparing people you know, to each other, let's say, what does that do? That fosters jealousy, that fosters envy, it fosters animosity between people, and it creates, it actually literally creates anxiety inside of the, the child. There's people who, um, if they always were compared in the way that they were communicating, all of this is just words, but words have a huge effect, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ told us to be very careful about our tongue, very careful about what we say, because the words that were said to people growing up and the amount of comparison maybe that was done to them between someone else in their peer group and, and themselves, um, it can be the cause for so much anxiety in that person. And that person could grow up and just be constantly on edge or constantly anxious because, and they never have a, a way to, to get over that anxiety. Why? Because the way the environment that was cultivated around them was always just look out for what everyone else does and, and you're kind of constant, you have an inferiority complex because that was cultivated in you all through the words that the parents had. And the parents just thought they were comparing us, you know, with, with somebody else with grades or whatever stage of life that they're at. But it was a lot worse than that in terms of the impact that it might have. So communication also has to be then done based on the context. And um, we should be more careful and more strategic and more wise and have some plan for communication on difficult topics. It shouldn't just be like the same, you know, like the same thing of like, hey, what are you having for dinner? It's not the same as like, all right, so who are you want to get married to? Like that, the two are very different. There are different degrees of conversation. One is a daily frequent conversation and the other hopefully just happens once in your life, like in terms of the, the, that, that category of life, the, the stage of life somebody's in. And so um, same thing then for the, 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 the children who are in that context who are communicating with their parents it should not be one if a situation is a triggering subject or it's bringing about animosity or anger or difficulty or stress or tension. That situation then, that means someone started it off on the wrong foot. And now that requires a reset in the communication. So that's another thing that can happen is in, in ineffective communication in, in the first place, it's okay to say, okay, you know what? We, we, we kind of like didn't really do this appropriately. I want to apologize. And I want to find a way to fix this and like have a discussion again instead of avoiding the topic entirely, which also happens. Someone has a gets on a bad start on a certain topic. Let's say this topic we just were mentioning and literally five, six, seven years and they don't never talk about it. And they're just off doing their own thing and literally don't take the advice of the most valuable people in their whole life on a very difficult decision. Why? Just because something started off on the wrong foot. Right, and that's that. That's again. This is this is one of the tactics of Shaitan. Is he tries to create uh, tension and dis and dissension between um, family members on on things where it would be really useful to have the family members help. Um, so these are some of the elements of uh, of communication. So we're gonna now talk about ways to practice this. Okay. So the first, the so practical uh, application. Let me three things we mentioned. The first is to. Uh, realize at a mindset level that what we say now and how we say it will have major implications. Think 5, 10, 20 times more than we realize implications down the line in that relationship with that person. So be very, very, very careful. This is not somebody who is just driving off on the road and you're never going to see them again. It's not like that. This is somebody we have to live with day in and day out. They're going to see us grow up. We're going to see them grow up. So the, the, it, the, when we communicate, we have to think, okay, this is a tool that I have to build this relationship. It's the main tool that I have. If I mess this up now, I'm going to mess up the whole relationship. I'm going to put the whole relationship on rocky footing. So let me be very, very careful how I approach this. And to, then that requires work on ourselves, right? It requires like sometimes if somebody is an angry communicator, a violent communicator, rude, um, uh, or arrogant, or maybe they don't communicate at all. Like they're just silent all the time. That's also a certain st class of communication where they're just like, hey, how are you? Like, how's it going? Good. Alhamdulillah. Okay, what's up? Like, can we talk about something? No, I'm okay. Like they're just, they're just, they get reserved, they get shut off. That's another communication style that somebody might have. All of those different things have to be then taken into context and know, okay, like I have to build a long-term relationship with somebody um, and, and, and keep that in mind communication. The second thing from a spiritual perspective 
is when things are not in a good place in a relationship and, and we're communicating poorly, um, we have to be okay blaming ourselves for the wrongs that we did rather than blaming the other person and saying, you know what, they messed all this up. That's that's very risky because that's one of the worst ways he, it's mentioned um, in, a, in, in, a, in a study uh, that that violent communication is one of the worst ways to, uh, or sorry, blame communication, which is a form of aggressive communication, is one of the worst ways to mess up a relationship. So you don't want to blame somebody, right, and just cause, um, uh, cause you know, you, it's your fault. You did this. You were the one who is the problem, and, and you did this to me, or you did this in the relationship. You did this in the marriage. I mean, that, that, that's not going to go anywhere, right? The, 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 the um, fair person takes level of accountability that's like accurate. The wise person takes on as much accountability as they can for the sake of preserving the relationship. They say, you know what? I'm so sorry for whatever we did. It's, it's, I just want to put it behind us. I'm really apologize. Even if they weren't in the wrong, this is the wise person, right? That those who restrain their anger, they pardon people, and Allah is the one who loves the people who do excellence. So, so somebody who's wise in their relationship and trying to, so in, in this concept of effective communication, this building block, they are going to be very, very, very focused on making sure that the, if the, the words that came out of their mouth in the last conversation, the fight, the argument, the tension, the stress, were problematic, that the next words that come out of their mouth are going to be healing. Versus the foolish person, they will say, how do I make this? It, 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 what they're really saying inside is, how do I make this worse? What do they, how do they do that? Nobody actually says that, but the way that they're saying it, um, or the way that they're, meant, they're, they're, they're exemplifying that is, let me just continue to pour fuel on this fire and prove that I'm right and that it's my position that's correct and I should get to do make the right decision. And like the type of things that we argue about, honestly, think about the type of some of the stuff that we argue about in our in our in our homes, in our relationships, there's like um like depth to it and then there's there's merit to it. But some of the other stuff, I mean, it's like what color should the wall be painted? Or like which, you know, which vacuum should we buy? People like the the grocery bill was more than it should be. Like the money, money is one of the single biggest cause of disputes in 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 a home. Money, dunya, I mean, that's there. We should be frugal if we need to be frugal to to live within a budget. But really, is that we're gonna let a relationship which is so deep be impacted by like dollars and cents and a bank account balance? I mean. That's a problem, right? So the, the, these are things, if we've seen them or if we learned them in the wrong way, we want to slowly, slowly, slowly work on undoing them, right? We want to find a way to um, uh, to, to unlearn them. Um, so this is a uh, uh, the second element. So the third one is we practice to, to have effective communication using I statements rather than you statements. So an I statement says, I really appreciate when you do such and such. I would love it if we could do it like this. Instead of saying you did this wrong, and 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 I didn't like it, right? There's a way to 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 practice this that um, begins with with what we can do better, or begins with something that um, that 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 uh, links back to 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 us instead of blaming them. And the reason why these become really 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 important is because they allow for us to communicate the feelings that we might have effectively. So, for example, let's say somebody's feeling really upset at a situation. We might want to start raising our voice and yelling and getting angry and, you know, and, and, and throwing something, whatever it is, right? But instead, what somebody who's, who's restrained themselves and restrained their nafs and practices this might say is, I, you know, I really feel upset when you do that. And it would, it, it would really... Uh, make me feel a lot better if you didn't approach it like that. Because this is a very, these, are, these are very basic things when we articulate them, but they have so much weight and so much impact. Instead of the, when the anger comes, it's not about like the way somebody is feeling and that being communicated with a qawl and sadida or with, with, uh, with, with, in a straightforward manner or with in good words. Instead, it turns into you are like this and this and there's all sorts of words that we didn't even know we could ever say about a person They come out, right? And that's going to damage the relationship and it's going to ruin the relationship. So those are the, that's the third. 
The fourth practical component, and this is a really important one, is where we actually have dedicated time for family discussion, where family members might share their thoughts or their concerns, and it's like a, a safe environment to be able to do that. So one of actually a, fr a friend and a teacher of mine mentioned to me once that his mom is a, um, I think a, a therapist or a psychologist, and so they would have a time every month where like everybody, all the family members get into a room and they just air it all out. Like everybody can say, "You did this, you know, this, this uh, I didn't like it when you did this, when you when you did this thing to me, and I didn't like it when you left the dishes in the in the sink, and I didn't like this, and I didn't like," and they just get it all out because they because his mom she knew he said that. If we didn't air out the small stuff, the big stuff it is, is, is just going to completely explode because these small things will be boiling up. But if we can air out the small stuff regularly, we'll know how to have mature dialogue on the difficult things. And one, one advice that I would give myself and all of us is really, really work on getting communication down on the small things. It's really important to have effective communication when it comes to the, the small day-to-day -day occurrences in our life. Like, don't, don't think that the small, if the small things in our life are not communicated with, uh, with, uh, effectively, when the big decisions come, we'll have no clue. And, I, and we'll just default to our nafs, our, per, our ego, our personality. So for the avoidant, silent person, they'll just run the other way and won't approach a difficult topic. For the person who's aggressive and angry, they'll just start to bat heads with somebody. For the person who um, loves to get into debates and arguments, they'll just be at it proving why this person is wrong, why this person is wrong. And again, this is we can all think of times in our life where maybe this has happened or in the lives of others that we know where this has happened, where the, 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 the small things weren't discussed. And so in big, again, an, an, an example um, can come to mind where uh, small things won't, won't, weren't discussed and weren't resolved with effective communication. And so then somebody, a, ch uh, a child gets you know older, they graduate college, let's say, and they want to move out. And maybe their parents are like of the view that, no, 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 you can't move out. You should guys live with me because, and they say, no, no, but all my friends are moving out and everybody's moving out. And now that instead of there being like a healthy, mature discussion, because in the rest of their life, most of the discussions weren't maybe healthy or mature. They were like either never resolved or kind of half resolved or like a fight would happen, but like they weren't never actually fixed and came to resolution. People would just kind of ignore it or shove it under the rug. Now, because that situation wasn't resolved appropriately, it erupts in um, a huge rift in a relationship between the child and between the parent. Where at some point, the child says, I don't really care what you have to say. I'm going to go do what I want to do. I already found an apartment. And the parent says, I don't want to even see you again because how dare you do this to me? And just, but that's such a simple, it's such a, it's, it, yes, it's a big decision, but it's a very educated, mature, anybody, two educated, mature people, right, could just have, or, or I should say wise, mature people could have a very simple, straight discussion about that, right? If somebody in our coworkers were to come up with us, to us and have a discussion like, you know, I uh, want to do something differently than the way we've been doing it, or... We're going to, um, uh, or I want to take a different strategy to the approach that we have, whatever else it is. Nobody is just going to start flipping out at them. You, you cannot because you'll get fired most likely. But even if that wasn't going to be the case, there's some, there's a social contract of manners that exist and etiquette. But for some reason, in our family environments, we don't have this social contract. It's a big problem because the Prophet them had the deepest spiritual contract. And this is why the two building blocks you mentioned last time are the first ones. It starts with love and affection, and then it moves on to respect and dignity, which then enters into the state where we are into the third building block of effective communication. And if there's no respect and dignity, and this is respect for everybody, the six-year-old should be respected, the 16-year-old should be respected, the 60-year-old should be respected. It's it's, it cannot be that someone is younger and that's that we give them no respect. No, I'm the boss. It's really risky when we as parents, um, just we just pull out the I'm the boss card. Yeah, the parents, we are the boss. Obviously, that's the whole relation. That's the authority structure. But that's not going to work. It's, 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 it's going to work for like a little bit of time and then it's going to backfire at some point because the trust won't be there. And because at some point, the Prophet Sallallahu he told us that at some point you transition to an age with your children where you want to become their friends. And not everybody wants to be friends with the boss.
Some people don't. Some people, they, they, they just want to have a yes, sir relationship with the boss, right? There needs to be a, a level. There is authority there, but it needs to be applied with wisdom, and that's where effective communication comes in. So this this practical example that's mentioned here of... Um, Muhammad, of, of some type of, of time for checking in. This is going to be really weird and awkward in the first like three or four times somebody does this. Like, okay, this is, we never done this before. Like, how do we do this? Right. But at some point, it just becomes like a norm in the home. Like, okay, we're going to have a time where we like, we just need to discuss what it, what happened this week that like someone didn't like. I'm going to go first and I'm going to say like, I really didn't like it when you, you know, left all the laundry unfolded and just stayed on the bed all week. Whatever random things that somebody has, right? I didn't like it when you, uh, when your room was like completely unclean. Instead of barging into the room and they never clean and do not do anything and you're so dirty and da 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 da, da. instead of doing that, just th that that's that's not that's not that's not a respectable, dignified way of communicating, and it's not going to make the person feel respectful. Just say, okay, now I'm going to address it, and then have an action plan. Okay, it would be really good if next time we approach it differently. And now we get into healthy dialogue and healthy conversations when, when it comes to communication. So um, so those are a couple of examples uh, as, it, as it relates to effective communication. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and move on. Uh, but this, is, this one is, again, easy to talk about. It's hard to do. So really, the, 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 it's where the rubber meets the road is what's going to be important. We actually go and we apply these things in our life. And if we're in that stage of where we're seeking a partner, we ask them, hey, how do you communicate? Like, what's your format of communication? Like, do you, do you tend to, to, to be somebody who actually discusses what's on their mind? Do you get really closed off? Are you somebody who uh, is avoidant? Right? Like, this stuff is all available. You can literally go on you know, chatgpt.com and ask what are the different forms of communication. And it'll tell you. And it'll be, you can ask it for sources. It'll give you sources and, and help you understand uh, what the different forms of communication. And then you can ask a prospective spouse, okay, what form of communication can um, uh, you, uh, what form of communication do you usually apply? And they might not have a phrase for it, but you'll be able to know, oh, they're like this. Now it's your job to decide, okay, is this, is there compatibility here, right? And is this something I'm okay with? And also start to ask questions on what kind of communication did you see growing up in the home? And so you have, that, that, that's usually the number one indicator of how someone is going to be in, in there in the marriage is what they saw at home. So if they saw like yelling and fighting and tension and name calling, then that's what they're going to default to. Now that doesn't mean that they're that you write them off, but now you have to be aware of that. Okay, that's what they're going to default to. So they'd be a, better be ready to work on themselves and you have to be ready to discuss that with them in order for compatibility to exist. Otherwise, we just carry the same patterns on over and over again. Um, so we'll, so that's, that's, that's the core building block on effective communication. Again, very, very important. The next one that we're going to move on to, um, inshallah, is a uh, building block of um, creating an environment of spiritual growth that's uh, in, in the home. And this goal, the objective here would be to build a spiritually engaged family, an aligned family, where there's some level of, sh there are clear shared values that promote growth in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our love for Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and our uh, growth in worship iba and ibadah and, and, uh, and in our character. So it's increasing in loving Allah and His Messenger, in worshipping Allah, in following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and in inculcating good care, and in, in, in worshipping more, and in inculcating good character. Those are the elements. That should be the core... Um, spiritual bedrock of the family environment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reminds us over and over again in the Quran about this. He says, for example, um, that, ya amanu, uh, that protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones. So uh, that protect yourselves uh, and your family from the fire. And then he describes because the fire literally is fueled by people. And to, 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 our goal should be that we don't want to be those people. And of course, we don't want anybody we love or really anyone from the Ummah of the Prophet to be any of those people. But he says, first, your first priority, this is where the scholars, they mention the priority, yourself and then your family. Before community and society and anyone else, it's the family. Make sure your family's on a good track and you yourself are on a good track. 
and then go and you know expand uh, elsewhere. So um, this is just setting the f the 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 order for us uh, and giving us a sense of the the deep responsibility that we have. That if we have a family, we have a responsibility to implement this verse. If we have a, a spouse, we have a responsibility to implement this verse. If we have parents, we have a responsibility to implement this verse. At whatever work we can do, right? And everybody is going to have a situation at some point in their life where you may be on a different spiritual path and trajectory than other people in your family. And that is, is all part of the dunya. Welcome to the dunya where Allah tests us through our, our family. And he tested Ibrahim alayhi salam through his, his father. And he tested Yaqub alayhi salam through his sons. The son, the, one of the greatest of Allah's prophets who had a son who was a prophet and Yusuf alayhi salam. And then he had multiple brothers who literally took, one, took Yusuf alayhi salam as we know in the story in the Quran and they threw him into a well so that he could and, 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 and literally did their best to try and kill him. And he was a prophet of God and he's being tested by this. And these are, those are his children. It doesn't mean that, he's, that he did something wrong. But it's a test that Allah sends. But so we are going to have situations where um, it doesn't mean that if you're a Muslim or you're a practicing Muslim or someone becomes a practicing Muslim that all of a sudden everybody in the family is just going to like start praying all the time and start having good morals and, and having the same alignment. No, half the battle is for the people who Allah is helping and guiding to then go and use the help that they're getting to go and help everybody else. It's not just to focus on our own selves, which is again why Allah says, protect yourselves and your family from the fire, right? So th th those are the, the core. And this is, we should feel this is a weighty responsibility. It's not a joke. This is really, really important. And it's actually, in the time that we live in, um, it's a huge problem if we are not regularly discussing with our children and our spouses what is our moral code, what are our spiritual values, because values in Western society are completely under attack. They're being flipped upside down. There's all sorts of problematic ideologies that are being introduced into, into schooling, into uh, the the education system into different ways in which we're you know people are, are uh, applying and living in their lives. Uh, there's a lack of God and godliness in most in most of society, and so there has to be intentional spirituality. Your uh, if if somebody doesn't intentionally bring religion into their life, then whatever else is out there will become your religion. That's what it's that's what it does. So they say philosophize, or you will be philosophized for. Meaning. Philosophize here is, is how you, the ideology by which we approach our life. Our ideology is Islam and that's exemplified through the Quran and through the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Our job is to understand how that applies in the unique context in which we live in, in, in you know, let's say in Western society. But um, if we never discuss that and we ourselves don't even know about that, how on earth are we going to expect our children? Do not think going to Sunday school for like an hour or two a week is going to do. That's not the point. Sun, no, nowhere does Allah say, send your children to Sunday school to learn their deen and don't do anything yourself. That's not the point, right? And we do, we are living in a society where sometimes we ourselves, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, we don't even know the basic fic of uh, of our religion. So we have to work on that, right? It's, and it's okay if we, if it, it's okay, meaning if that's where we're at right now, we have to accept it and work on it. Not okay in that we, if we're not there, we just let ourselves get there. Um, but, but this has to be seen as a huge priority. What is our religion? What is our framework? Um, and we see this uh, in the advice in Surah Luqman, in Luqman that um, Luqman, uh, he gives to his son, uh, radiallahu an, he gives to his son, which he says, worship Allah alone establish the prayer. He tells him to be humble and he tells him to be patient. So Allah is now modeling, Allah is teaching us, okay, so this is how one of the main things that parents are supposed to teach their children are what? Tawheed, ibadah, and worship, and good character. Those are the things that he taught in this verse, right? And of course, within, within all of that, within a religious system, there's going to be a lot of other things that come out of it, family relationships, respecting, you know, uh, fa and maintaining family ties and so on and so forth. Um, but this is one ayah that, that, that mentions it. And so when, when our children are young, if that framework is there, 
it's embedded from a young age. And then it's going to be like, oh yeah, that's just what we do. Like we, 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 if somebody always says la ilaha illallah in front of their children and the children always see them praying and even while the children are asleep, sometimes you're in their room, you know, having to comfort them and you know, you have to pray Fajr uh, and, and, and they're there and they're watching you. They know that you're there. They know that you're praying. If that's what they see, they're going to do that. But if that's not what they see, don't expect there to be an age where they come and you're like, oh, why aren't you praying? And they're like, well, Baba, you never, what do you mean? Where, why aren't you praying, actually? That's, like, that's what they're going to think. But they're like, I don't know why I'm not praying because I never saw you do it. right? If the, the, the Jamaat prayer, and this is the job of men, the man is responsible for establishing the prayer in the home. It's a responsibility. And if the man is not going to the masjid to pray, then, then the man sh must make sure that at home the prayer is being prayed by themselves and by everybody in the home. Otherwise, they do have accountability for that. So this is also something that's been lost in societies in which we live in, where we forget about the actual roles. We do have gender roles in our religion. It is a thing. For 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 not in the triggering way that people here might talk about it in in in, in you know in Western culture, but like there's responsibility. A man does have a responsibility in his home, and a woman has a responsibility in her home. And 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 with that, there comes. Um, an accountability for that responsibility. So if we're the man in the home and we never set a spiritual uh, culture and then, you know, Fajr comes in, everybody's asleep, we're asleep, everyone's asleep, uh, Dohar comes in, everyone's watching TV, like they're just, that is not living up to the responsibility God gave. If we get like a, uh, if, 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 if we took that same standard and applied it to school, right, that would be like a D minus in school. Like we're just doing, basically we're failing. Right, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. To at least get passing is to make sure we're doing the bare minimum, and then we have to add on top of that. So worship and ibadah are from the, the core, core elements, and this is exemplified by the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He would encourage his family to perform worship together. He would wake his wives for the prayers. He would wake his wives for the fajr prayer, and many times he would pray qiyam and tahajjud. He would wake their, his wives up, and he would wake... Uh, Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu anha, for example, for, for Salat al-Hajjad from, well, from time to time as well and encourage them to do it. Ibadah was the main way he, he taught us that this is the core. It starts with Ibadah, right? Um, well, it starts with knowledge and then Ibadah is application of the knowledge, but, but uh, that app applying that is really, really, really important. So let's talk about how we go, how we go about doing this. Um, if we assume, let's say that let's, let's start in a situation where we are um, not married yet. Let's say someone's not married and they're looking to get married. One of the main questions we should have in, that con in, in the conversation with the prospective spouse is like, what kind of values do you have when it comes to religion? And break it down into like, okay, so how much do you emphasize um, the religion in the decisions that you make? This is going to become very important. Someone makes a financial decision. One person says, I have no problem taking haram uh, financial uh, uh, loans, interest-bearing loans. Another person says, hey, I actually do have a problem with that. Boom, clash number one. Now what are you going to do? Right? There has to be somebody, somebody who, so, and someone might say, well, the religion says this. And someone else might say, I actually don't care what the religion says because I'm going to do what I want. And that's just nafs. But people do that all the time. Right? Like it's, it's, it, it happens regularly. And the third person might, and that third wave might say like, oh, I didn't even know that really. Okay, let me try to figure that out. And that's like, okay, some people didn't know that that was a haram situation to be in. Now we have to work on figuring that out. But the second response is really dangerous. That's immediately a sign where compatibility could be impacted. You might say, hey, um, uh, how important are the prayers to you? Oh, you know, they're, they're, I guess they're important. Like I go to Jumma and pray like, you know, a little bit every now and then. But um, I'm, not, I'm not really on it yet, you know. And if you're someone who's praying like five times a day consistently and that question is asked and the spouse, the, the prospective spouse is not even close to that, okay, now that's evaluation criteria for you. you have to, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to have this discussion? Is this something that I see that, 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 they, that they clearly don't value it, right? And so um, that's going to, that should factor into the decision making. So there should be some values we lay out. Everybody, we know what the ideal is. We have our own path on, on how far on the spectrum are we from the ideal. We say, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be at. Our spouse should be like at least somewhere in the middle, if not, you know, closer to the ideal. Definitely not like a lot farther than where we're at because that's not going to, to be a wise, um, a wise conversation. But unfortunately, in the time that we live in, these conversations aren't even being had because somebody looks at someone else 
on you know Instagram and finds them attractive and starts having a conversation with them and it's all about their beauty and their looks. Beauty and looks are not going to have any impact once you're married on the things that actually matter. When the fights come and the yelling comes and the arguments come, it doesn't matter how beautiful that person is. Because if that person is not resolving things with character and with adab, that per you might end up divorcing them or end up uttering the words of divorce out of anger. Had that person had akhlaq, which is the main quality we look for, is religion and akhlaq in a potential spouse. Akhlaq means good character, good manners, and that can be seen sometimes through the family that they come from. Not always. Sometimes a good family may not um, always have you know a, a child who's great, and sometimes a quote unquote family who may not be very you know uh, uh, follow certain moral standards may have like amazing you know children. So that doesn't always have to be the case. And actually, I would advise. Um, parents who did not grow up in the U.S. to be very careful of making the same link that your parents made when they were considering um, your prospective spouses because the, dis the difference between one generation and the next is very vast once you come to Western society. I know people who've literally been introduced to someone. They say, oh, the family is a great family. The guy drinks alcohol. Oh, how, the kid, how, are, you, how are you supposed to know that? Well, you're supposed to know that you're supposed to realize that the great, the, a great family doesn't mean that the child um, is is practicing the religion. There has to be some other vetting done versus there used to be a time and place where that, that didn't happen, right? And so don't just say, oh yeah, it's a good family, you should talk to them. No, 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 go and vet. Like, do some digging, do some homework before, because otherwise when that prospect is presented to the ch to, to you know, your children, they're not going to trust you anymore. And I know this has happened. Like someone who I know was presented somebody who maybe smokes, drinks, they're completely against their values. And they're like, wait, and it was presented by like a close family member. They're like, wait, you didn't vet this stuff? And they're like, oh no, I just know their mom and she's a really good person. No, that doesn't work anymore. It used to work. It has to, it has to go, you have to go four or five layers deeper to do some due diligence before presenting somebody. Otherwise, the children will lose that trust, right? The, uh, in, in, in you giving the options. Um, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's kind of a side note, but the, the main thing here is in the conversations, what are the spiritual values? And there are criteria. I would recommend a book, um, Handbook of a Healthy Muslim Marriage uh, by uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Yusuf. It's good for people who are already married, and it's especially good for people who are looking to get married because it gives a guideline of questions and categories that we should dig into a little bit deeper. And the spiritual one should be the first. It's not the last, and it definitely shouldn't be ignored. Like this stuff, just, just vet it up front. And it's, it's okay if it doesn't go in the right direction, then you just move on from that person, right? So that's now, let's say, somebody who's in that situation. Then let's say someone else is in a situation where now if we're already married and we, we never had that conversation, let's say, or you're like in a family and you never had that conversation, maybe you got married 20 years ago and that, con that, that, that was never a priority. Now we have to have a time to have that conversation of like, okay, so we have a goal here in this life. And our goal is not about buying the biggest house. It's not about buying the nicest car. It's not about having the most amount of wealth. It's not about having uh, our children accomplish things that we can brag about to everybody else. That's not the goal in life. These are the things Allah described in the Quran, some of these categories, as the distractions and the the haughtiness of the world, the zina of the hayat al-dunya, the, 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 the um, embellishments of the world. That's not the point. Those things, if they happen, that if that's something we're distracted with, it's something we're distracted with. The core focus of this life is for our partners and ourselves to work together to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the, that's the point. That's the point. And that's why um, the soulmate is a deep soulmate. And we're, we, if, if, if that compatibility is there, it's an eternal compatibility, meaning we're with our spouses, inshallah. If Allah blesses us with, with Jannah, we ask that he does, inshallah, that he, we, we are with our spouses. So that conversation needs to happen. So we begin with, and this is now getting into the practical, we begin with, okay, so what's our goal? The goal is we want to get close to Allah and we want to do that together. Okay, so now how do we do it? The first, the second step here now, once you know the goal, is knowledge. Where are we at with knowledge? Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Nothing can, can start without knowledge and nothing can be healed without knowledge and nothing can be fixed without knowledge and no relationship can be set aright without proper knowledge. And we have lost as a community and as an ummah the emphasis on knowledge. And we have to go back to knowledge. We have to limit the distractions we have in our life and go back to seeking knowledge. This doesn't mean we have to become 
um, you know, academics or scholars or something, but just some level of knowledge to know how to operate in the context that we're operating in. Um, we should not need to, um, uh, on basic on basic matters, we shouldn't struggle to figure out like what would the Prophet Sallallahu do in this matter. Like, let me call my religious uncle. No, it's not that hard. Just we just have to read a book. Read the book; it's available, and we can we can you know you can go on Amazon. You can come to your house by tomorrow morning, and you can read it, and it's great. And then we can have the knowledge. Like one book we read can inform twenty years of decisions, and yet we spend hours watching some Netflix show. And it doesn't inform it. That actually does inform our decisions in the wrong way. And we might like do the things we see on TV and the dramas that we watch and so on. So it begins with knowledge. So the first principle is then, okay, so we have a conversation with our spouse or with our children. Hey, we want to like, we want to create an environment where we're going to learn what's important. Let's go and actually um, uh, create this spiritual code that we want to live by and the culture we want to live by in our family together. And there's a spectrum here in Islam. Not everybody applies the religion in the exact same way there's there's levels of application all have to be correct and valid and have to be within the the frameworks of the tradition but some people may choose to have more strict stances on certain things other people may choose to have more moderate stances on certain things as long as someone is have is is following an acceptable ruling within the religion that's alhamdulillah a good thing and then the goal is we progress further and further so knowledge is going to be the really the most important so the the practical way applies have a conversation with your family Discuss it with them and say, okay, um, we need to make sure that we are learning together. And when you learn together and the father and the mother are teaching each other and then the children are joining in on that and we're actually discussing the religion together, that has a huge effect on building a bond with the family. Because you're going to say, oh, you know, the Prophet did this and the children are going to say, oh, really? How did he do it? And they're going to say, oh, let's go. We're going to figure it out. And then... Instead of them getting all that information from, you know, somebody else on, on the weekend for an hour or two a month and then coming home and telling us about it while we're like watching football or something like that. Like it's, it's, it's not the right way to create the spiritual environment that we want. So knowledge. And there's categories of knowledge. There should be, we learn, it's called the fard ayn. The fard ayn are the individual obligations we have in our life. The fiqh of how to pray, of how to fast, of how to make wudu properly, how to pay zakat, financial transactions. Right, uh, the, these these components. How to make Hajj if we go to when we go to Hajj, inshallah. Um, that's the far the, the core knowledge is those. Everybody, it's our job to make sure we know them, and it's the job of the of the person who is uh, in authority in the household, so the father or the mother, to make sure that everybody else knows them. So for the father to make sure everybody knows it, and for the mother to make sure that that she knows it, and for the children to know it. Right, but the accountability is there. If we grow up and our children grow up and they don't know these basics. They can lit and there's 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 uh, narrations about this. They will literally blame the parents on the day of judgment. They didn't teach me. They didn't teach me. They taught me. They let me go to school. They they I learned algebra and algebra two and trigonometry and calculus A B and B C and chemistry and physics and all this stuff. But I don't even think my wudu was proper. I never really learned how to make wudu. And maybe I learned it, but like I don't wasn't doing it correctly. I mean, it's, 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 it's just shaitan. He tries to get us to prioritize the wrong things. We can prioritize both of them, but one has a higher priority, which is the religion. So that is the first, the, 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 the step of knowledge. So far the ayn, and then there's what's called the, um, the, the knowledge of fiqh, and then the knowledge of good character. The knowledge of good character, ty the type of stuff we're talking about right now, but really this is knowledge of how to purify the heart. How to purify the heart. So there's been, if, if someone is, you know, it comes to this much at MCC, there's various lectures online. Uh, in the MCC YouTube, which um, have been taught on uh, texts on purifying the heart, and one can watch those and refer to those, um, uh, that and 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 learn. Okay, these are the core diseases of the heart, how they come about. That's an obligatory knowledge to learn. Meaning, we'll be asked about it if we didn't learn it. It's not optional. These are not like, you know, these these aren't. These, none of this is extra credit. This is all basics, all the basics, right? Once somebody has those down, then they move on to the knowledge of um, the situation that they're in in life right now. So if we are married, one has to learn the fiqh of marriage and the fiqh of divorce. Um, it's, 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 it's wajib. It's, oblig it's an obligation. Otherwise, someone could utter a word that could indicate divorce and they, could, they wouldn't even know. They would have no understanding. And then now they're just like confused and living in a, and they could be living in a haram setup and not even realize it. And, and, and when it comes to knowledge... It's not enough, and this is a statement that not, it's not everybody likes to hear this, but it's not enough to say, I didn't know. 
that's not enough to say. I just, I didn't know. It wasn't my intention. It's not enough. And knowledge, when it comes to obligatory knowledge, we are asked about what we are supposed to know. And our children, once they hit puberty, will also be asked about what they're supposed to know, and it will fall on us. So we want to have, we want to take this a little bit seriously um, in terms of the the way we apply it. So those are the knowledges. Then once the knowledge is down, so the goal is get close to Allah, the knowledge is down. The next level is practice, implementation of the knowledge. The main thing we can do in the home are two, well three. First, ibadah. Ibadah should be like our home should be a home where at minimum the five prayers are prayed. Right, like that's not that's not like a a, a um, that should not be the maximum goal. The minimum should be everybody's praying five prayers every every season of the year, not just in the winter time. Every season of the year, all prayers are prayed, and then from there, there should be other things that are done. If they're not done, now we have to do the work to think. Okay, how do I implement this spiritual code back into the home? How do I go about? creating an environment where we will pray regularly and consistently, inshallah. And how do I wake up early enough? If you have like four kids and all of them are of praying age and they all like to sleep in and none of them wake up in their alarm, guess what? You better wake up early for Fajr and make sure then you're going in every 10 minutes and waking up every kid until the one hour and 10 minutes from the time Fajr enters to the time Fajr exits, every single child has prayed. Right? Until they get into a rhythm where they pray themselves. What the nafs wants to do is we'll just let them sleep, their children, or their, you know, they're only teenagers. No, 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 no. That's that's really dangerous for them, for them and for you. Right? So so there's a level of, of practice. The practice should also be a serious practice. It shouldn't be like a light, we just kind of leave it, you know, do do when we want. That's the worship. The second part of this is the income that we bring in. The income that we bring in in a home is going to influence the baraka that's in that home or not. So if the income is haram, um, let's say from a, from selling alcohol or liquor, drugs, um, uh, interest bearing loans, um, anything you know, weapons, uh, uh, anything that 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 is um, considered among the categories of haram financial transactions, the home environment is going to be uh, impacted because that means that the food that you eat will be haram, the clothing that you wear will be haram, the couch that you sit on will be haram. The home that you're living in is haram. The bed that you're sleeping in is haram. Again, none of this stuff is easy to hear, right? It's difficult. But like, inshallah, the vast majority of people's incomes are, are completely okay. But if somebody is in that category, it's just okay. I have to go and find other forms of employment because I can't risk my income being you know, in a haram situation. And then the third is the food that we eat. The food that we eat in the home should be halal and tayyib, and it will create the because food literally translates into the energy that we have and the energy is what gives us the energy to do ibadah and if that energy is not coming from a pure source it will not do halal it will the natural inclination will be to do haram and um, unfortunately it also happens regularly um, or i see this from time to time where a child might be like 17 18 20 19 20 and um, they let's say that they're smoking, smoking marijuana or something like that. Parents will say, "What am I? What do I do? My children are smoking. My children are partying. My children are doing this." And then you say, "Okay, well, what do they eat? Like, what? What, what, what does that have anything to do with it?" Well, they grew up. They grew up eating all sorts of haram food. Now, their their the natural inclination is going to be for them to do haram. Like the two, it doesn't mean that it's an excuse for it, but like it's not going to be undone that easily. You can't just have like a one day, all of a sudden, they stop doing something that their body has been nurtured on doing, right? So this is why halal tayyib food is so critical for the um, cultivating a healthy spiritual environment. And if somebody isn't there, they slowly, slowly, slowly work on uh, inculcating that and work on bringing that in um, uh, until they can get to that point. So that's worship. That's the, 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 the three categories of worship. Then the third category is where there is... Um, some level of uh, collective dua that people make. This kind of falls into worship as well. But it's really important for a family to have time together where they just like s discuss their religion. It might be over dinner. It might be on a Friday. Um, uh, I've seen some of our teachers, like they have the time be before Maghrib on Friday um, uh, where th their family is together for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They do salawat together. They, they make dua together. They have a little discussion, right? That it doesn't have to be all the time, just but just some amount of time, right? Because then we'll know, okay, there's there's sa there is a sacred component to our time. Because even with the prayer, someone could be praying, but then you know there's other stuff somebody has to do. So this is you know this is our dedicated time. We are going to sit. We're going to make dua. And the recommendation here would be that let each person of the family lead the dua at a, at, you know a different week. 
don't just have like you know the, the dad always make the dua no mom should make dua too and the, the son and the daughter and everybody should do it like even if they're a five-year-old like teach them they're not going to learn otherwise right like let them do it and 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 have a have a have an element of that in the home so now what this does at a spiritual level this invites nur and um uh Uh, this invites nur and um, and baraka into the home, and light into the home, and angels into the home. And when nur and angels come into the home, this has this is probably of the building blocks we discussed one of the most potent, because it it creates an environment where there's so much so much angelic presence in the home that just entering into the home you feel peaceful. And there's sakina and sukun there. And then even when someone does get heated or gets into a, a difficult state, the baraka of that home calms that home, calms that person down. Versus the opposite home, which might have haram regularly into that home. And there's no prayers that are done in that home. And there's no dhikr that's done in that home. And there's no spiritual values that are followed in that home. And now that home is full of dark energies. Shayatin are present in that home. Jinn are present in that home. There's a lot of difficulty that could be present in that environment. And then you just enter into that environment, you feel tense and and, and anxious and, and stressed. The two are very much, like there's a very clear link between the way someone feels and the environment that's been created inside of the uh, inside of the environment, inside of the home, and in terms of from a spiritual perspective. Um, and, and it doesn't mean we're never going to have any problems or anything like that if we try to do these things, but it will the, the problems will be will be mitigated a lot faster, right? Um, because the things are being avoided. And then and then the last element of this is that we discuss what what are our spiritual values as a family, right? And remind ourselves it shouldn't be like about us as like as, in, as, 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 a, as a unit. It should be about what are our spiritual values as Muslims and what can we do to please Allah and his messenger the most. And so then when an interaction happens, someone is like, you know, like I was about to... Um, you know, I got, I have, I have, I have had a test yesterday, and I didn't know any of the answers. So, like, I was about to look over my friend's shoulder and just copy all their answers at school. But then I remembered that in our religion, like, we're supposed to be people of integrity, and cheating is haram. And I knew that I was taught not to do that, so I didn't do it. And they discussed that thing with us, and we're like, okay, alhamdulillah. Like, and then we'd have a, you know, someone dis you have a discussion about integrity, and like the discussion on values come up. But if no one's ever taught that, that's that's like a value of ours. Of our and, and it's applied to the situation we're in in school or marriage or whatever else it is, then if everybody else is cheating, you're like, well, I guess this is fine. I might as well just copy everybody's answers too, right? And then no, there's no element of, um, uh, of, of, of an ethical dignity that's present. So the this last element of discussing these things and saying, okay, you know what? I really need to make sure that we understand our moral code and our values. And then when someone, and then, and then the, taking this a step further, would be that, okay, when you learn X, Y, Z in school, here's how you understand it, right? Because there's going to be stuff that's taught that's antithetical to religion or that's just like atheistic in nature. And so now somebody who's been going through these things, they will know they'll have the spiritual fabric to respond and the bedrock to respond. And then they'll also now, when you teach them intellectually, they'll understand. Versus you try to tell someone, Oh, today I learned about evolution in school. No, no, we don't believe in evolution. Well, why don't we believe in evolution? It's haram to believe in evolution. Okay, so why is it haram? Because we don't believe in evolution. Why don't we believe in evolution? Because we believe in God. Okay, so how do we explain what we just learned? Well, because it, that's the, that's haram. That's what the kuffar do. I mean, that's circular reasoning. It's not going to work with anyone who has, you know, like some thinking behind it. It might work when we're four years old, five years old, seven years old. But it's not going to work in seventh grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade. No, you need to you need to have that stuff down. It's your job as a parent, my job as parents, our job to learn it. And so it's not. There's lectures on YouTube. You can you can study it. Um, uh, scholars talk about this stuff, and then you say, okay, now my child is learning this. Here's how I'm going to help them respond. And when I say you say, you know what, beta, I actually don't know, but what you're saying is totally right. Let's go look into it further. I'm going to go find some scholar. I'm going to bring someone to you to help you. It doesn't mean we have to have all the answers, but our answer cannot be, well, no, it's just because it says, that's what it says. And this, you know, then let's move on to another topic because then they're going to be thinking about it and we're going to have lost the teaching moment in that situation. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and apologize. We went a little bit over today. Uh, we'll go ahead and end. Um, and if there's any questions that anybody has, please go ahead and post them in the chat. We have a little bit of time left and um, we can go ahead and go.
uh, someone asked how do we try to eat zabiha um, over halal with increased demand of meat. Uh, okay, so I think uh, what they might be referring to is um, if you're trying to practice um, like a level of scrupulousness in the meat that one consumes. So uh, the key here is that somebody understands, okay, you know what, I have like a standard for the type of meat that I'm going to buy and I'm going to allow into my home. You go and you find somebody, like the ideal is someone finds um, a brand or something that they like trust. It's ideally that the, the, the strongest opinion on halal meat is that it's hand slaughtered um, non-stunned and there's a few other categories one can look into um, but there's varying degrees of opinions that somebody could follow within that they find that and then you just stick to it and you stick to it and when you have a situation where you go to a restaurant you go out to eat you either avoid something which you could have a doubt in or you go with a you know an alternative option seafood or, or you know something else um, but if that's if that's the type of question that you're answering you know you, sh you should be good for the most part with anything that says it's it's halal what we're referring to is like first and foremost staying away from having like a burger from like in and out or something like that would not be considered you know, like burger king or something that would not be a good a good idea um you want to stay away from those things or or eating food which has the same it's cooked in the same oils as like pork is cooked for example you go to like a restaurant you eat a pancake that they made in the same frying pan as the bacon which a lot of these places they, they likely do that you don't ask, so it's not like you didn't ask so that it didn't happen. It did happen, and now basically all that lard and all that nudges and everything is now in the food, and you don't want to do that. Yeah. What's the website uh, which you stated to watch videos? So uh, the website, um, so uh, MCC has a YouTube page, uh, Muslim Community Center East Bay, um, and on the YouTube page, you know, Hamdallah, there's like hundreds if not thousands of videos at this point. Um, there are lecture series on various topics. All the topics we talked about with regards to the types of knowledge that we want, um, for the most part, they've been covered, right? There's various series on that. So that one we were referring to is Purification Hard Series. Um, there's also a site for someone if you want to learn online in a more structured, curriculum-oriented way. There's a site called seekersguidance.org. Um, Seekers Guidance also has excellent online courses. They're free. Um, they're kind of like on demand, so you don't have to wait for like a session to start. You can just register for the course. You can download them. Then there's like sessions, 10, 12, 15 classes. There's worksheets, I think, or curriculum that, that you can follow along that will cover all the, the topics that we discussed um, that you want to make sure are, to, are, are covered. So first of all, thank you for this series. Yep. And uh, I have uh, I've been listening to this talk of yours. Like that, and that made me that you should listen to the translation. Uh, so I have a question. So usually what happens like regarding the communication. So we know the problem. We have to sit down and communicate. But sometimes you don't, I mean, maybe that person doesn't want to communicate due to the family environment. And uh, if you have small kids, so um, I mean, where, I mean, you can do an effort of having a healthy communication so that, you know, that we can discuss what is our spiritual goal or I mean, it's not like finding faults. It's just what track we should take that our family to navigate there. Sometimes it's very difficult. I mean, um, so in that situation, so either we have two options. Either we give up, like we don't do that communication. And it's like you're continuing the same generational right. um, family structure. Right. Or you try to resolve it. But what are the effective ways? I mean, it's if you are trying to, like you have, like whether any, like you have elders also in the family, and how to strike that communication in an effective way, I think if you could share some questions. Yeah, very good question. And for those online who might not have heard the question, excellent question. Um, so it's it's essentially, if I'm understanding, it's um, so we, we understand that communication is important. And we want to try to have effective communication, uh, but it's easier said than done. So when we have situations where it's a tricky relationship. Maybe the person is not receptive to the communication. Maybe there's elders in the family who just have a certain way of doing things, which we're not going to be able to, we don't believe we can, you know, easily influence or impact. Um, or we've been trying and trying and we'd like a feeling like maybe we should give up. We don't exactly know what the right course is. How do we approach that? That's a very good question. So, um, when we're trying, so, so most of what we were talking about when it came to communication was, how to, let's say, build the environment um, in a way that fosters effective communication. But when we're trying to fix an environment, 
that is already somewhat, let's say, damaged. Um, it requires a bit of a different approach than just taking the building blocks. Now you have to add a few extra layers and a few extra things. Uh, so now what we want to approach it as we are trying to change somebody who has a, f a fixed way of doing things. And the way in which our, that, that's kind of like, a f and we're trying to invite them hopefully to like what's correct. And that's in our religion, a form of dawah. It's a form of, of inviting. And, and so the first thing that we do when we're trying to invite is we have a consistent period of time where we are waking up in the middle of the night praying for that person. That is the most important thing. Without that, you basically think you're in charge. And in, and in da'wah, you're never in charge. In, in the Prophet Islam's da'wah, he was taught and he knew that he's not in charge and he's the greatest of Allah's creation. Allah is in charge of changing hearts. Allah is the one. And so this is now a... A, a rupture has happened. We have to repair it somehow. And so we really, Allah wants us to rely on Him and to turn to Him. And so that will rarely be fixed without a lot of tears, a lot of dua, a lot of, a lot of tears while making dua as well. There's going to be all of that in there, right? And, and, it, and the secret that the Prophet taught us is the tahajjud to, to get this right. Um, and so if it's something we can do every day, Alhamdulillah. If it's something we're not there yet where we can do it every day or there's times where it's, we're you know, young kids, it's busy, you're exhausted, there's sleep issues, um, you pray at night. You do it after Salat al-Isha, right? So like if now Isha comes in early, have a, a 20, 20 minutes set aside at nighttime, just I'm going to pray nafila after nafila after nafila just to pray for this situation. That's the first step. The second step that's taken is um, you try a different approach than the communication that before the communication is even brought up. So instead of like sitting down at home, let's say, and bringing it up, you say, "Hey, like I want to let's like let's let's go out for ice cream. I want to talk to uh, just this, hey, let's go hang out." Right? And you have a couple of times where the relationship is sweetened a little bit before the discussion has happened. If if not in the first conversation, right? So like if that relationship has been damaged, it might even be with an elder or a child, somebody else. Um, you have to make sure we create now an environment where they're going to want to listen to us. If the first thing we always say is, well, this is wrong and I want to fix it, they're just going to be like, oh, great. Now we're going to talk about this again. Or kids will be like, oh, great. Parents are lecturing me again. Now I have, and, I, and this is in one ear, out the other is usually what tends to happen. So it's, no, no, I just want to hang out. I just really just want to like connect. And just you, and this is where now you, you, turn, you turn the switch. You're sorry, you turn the roles and you just ask questions and you just listen, listen, listen and let the person talk. And somewhere, somehow in the five, 10 hangouts that are gonna happen, you will learn something about their life. If it's an elder, about something that happened to them growing up, about something that they did, about something that upset them, about some random thing, oh, this thing happened when your child, you know, when their grandchildren were born and the akika wasn't done the way I wanted and it's been upsetting me. And oh, there's some people have the most random psychologies that something small, that might be small to us happens, it creates a huge deal in their mind. They never got it out. And now they're just like become stubborn about it. Let's just say as an example. So now that comes out. So now you know you have your data points, right? This is like a you have to have a strategy here. So you've you've relied on Allah number one. You've extracted stuff and you've done a level of um, uh, of build repairing and building the relationship. Now you come up with how am I going to communicate this? And it's done over a gradual period of time. So you might have another conversation, you take them out somewhere, you go out somewhere and just like, hey, just like, I just want to fix things. Like, I don't really know what's wrong. Do you have any ideas? Like, do we have any, you know, you have any ideas on how we can improve this? Don't always say, well, the way we should do it is we should follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And da, da, da. No, 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 that's not going to work with most people. If somebody doesn't want to do that, they're not going to do that. So then if you want, there's other, this is called tact, where you don't, if you have a goal, let's say you want religion to be established in your household, you want a moral code, but someone is like allergic to religion. I've had this experience before. They're allergic to religion. So you have to use other ways to, to establish it without using the word religion, but you have to get religious principles established. And there's various ways that you can do that, right? You can talk about, you know, in your culture or something else that this is, this is an important um, emphasis in, in our culture. We should really make sure we have manners and respect. And so I wanted to bring that up. And you find ways or like some person they really love, like their grandparent or somebody who was religious. And you can say, you know, but you don't say that they were religious. They were such a good person and they did it like this. I'd love to do it like that, you know. So you have to be really tactful in the approach, right? And if you do a mixture of these things, inshallah, over time with the most emphasis going on relying on Allah, 
um, the the situation will be. Well, inshallah, inshallah, Allah will resolve it. Because Allah says, فَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will always give them a way out. So that's like, that's our, our reliance is on Allah and on taqwa of Allah. And then he, we just say, okay, I'm doing what I can do. Now Allah is going to give me a way out. We never lose hope in that. Inshallah. Um, okay, so there's one more question online and then we'll go ahead and end because the adhan is going off. So someone mentioned... Um, how does one handle a spouse that is troubled mentally? Maybe they had difficult a difficult situation in the past. Um, and so how does one uh, deal with that? They're hypersensitive, uh, really anxious. Um, yeah, so there's three things uh, that come to mind here um, that you would want to do. So the first is Allah says for your spouse that you are a garment for them and they are a garment for you. So you have to reassure them of your protection and your um uh, that, that you are there for them and you affirm that over and over again because if you're seeing maybe they have abandonment issues they have anxiety issues they have a sensitivity issue they have um uh stress that kind of deep deep lodged inside you want to try to fix that by really really reassuring them so it's frequent conversations of reassurance is going to be really important here um number two is that you ask a lot of questions to them, so just like the, the advice that we were giving in, in, in the past um, question, that you ask questions to them to say, okay, so you know what's going on here? Like, did something happen? You're, 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 you said this, but I think it might be something deeper that might be going on. Like, what actually happened? And you try to understand: is there something specific that happened? Um, until they speak to you about it, right? and and ideally that they will mention it to you, and then you can you can kind of give advice to try and help them. And the third thing that that we can do in this instance is. Um, and perhaps next time I can try to think of a more kind of comprehensive answer for this, uh, inshallah, is where the, the positivity and the positive affirmations that are mentioned in the home are become the dominant influence. Because most of the time people who portray anxious behavior and these types of things did it because they have a very deep negative psychology, inferiority complexes, all these things. So you have to now do the work. Um, to rebuild them. You have to build them back up because they were broken down over time. And that's done through lots of affection, through lots of words of affection, through lots of positive phrases, through words of affirmation, through complimenting them. Um, and then lastly, if it is something that could be, you know, a mental issue of some sort, then one, you would want to seek like proper professional help, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist, um, because you don't want this to persist um, over time. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. Alhamdulillah. So we'll go ahead and end with a with a short dua, and then it's Salat Isha. So yeah, again next week, uh, same time, six thirty p.m. Wednesdays for those online. That's Wednesdays Pacific time, six thirty to seven thirty roughly, and then we do about twenty minutes of Q and A after that. Inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiyul alim. Wa tawbalayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa nusurna ala alqom al kafirin. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we ask, Ya Allah, that you accept from us, that you pardon us, that you forgive us, that you remove our tribulations and our worries, and that you, Ya Allah, give faraj and relief to our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, and all over the Muslim world who are suffering. Ya Allah, that you end their suffering and the tribulation, and that you give us the ability to use our time and our energy and our and our faculties and everything you've given us, Ya Allah, in your worship and your ibadah, in deepening our relationships with you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, and that you give us, Ya Allah, tawfiq and nur and barakah in our homes and that you help anybody here with any tribulation that they're having with their family members, their spouses, their children or difficulties or worries, that you remove their anxieties from them and that you cure them and that you heal their home and that you make our homes full of light and of dhikr and of remembrance of you and of your, Ya Rabbil Alameen, your sakina, Ya Allah, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barakatuh, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.